to the extent that the policy objectives are, uh, um, are recognized. And, uh, and so the, the, the DAO model law is this, uh, this effort that uh, uh, essentially tries to play on the notion of functional equivalent and uh, regulatory equivalence as a way of, um, on the one hand, identifying the extent to which a DAO can be regarded as being functionally equivalent to other type of uh, uh, recognized legal entity, such as uh, association, companies, corporations, cooperative, and so forth. But then also, uh, given this functional equivalence, to which extent can the technological guarantees that are provided by blockchain technology um, could be regarded as uh, uh, achieving different, in a different manner the same objective of transparency, of verifiability, and so forth. And, um, and because this is something that needs to be solved, uh, it cannot be something that, that is resolved in one single jurisdiction. It's something that needs to be recognized more at the global level. This is what brought us to uh, draft this document. Also keeping in mind that uh, the ultimate objective or the primary objective of this document is essentially that we want to make sure that a conversation is created between, the, um, between DAOs and uh, uh, regulators and policymakers. Um, because there needs to be um, more interaction between those actors also for the policymaker to understand uh, the issues that are currently encountered by non-incorporated DAOs and, uh, and also the opportunities that the technology provides in order to explore those different regulatory equivalent uh, uh, solutions. And so we, we started the process uh, almost three years ago now. Uh, we are currently in the process of revising the DAO model law. Uh, so we, we will be very eager to hear back uh, from the audience if you have any suggestion, if you have uh, questions, but also if you want to participate and collaborate uh, in the revision and the evolution of this DAO model law, given uh, uh, the new developments that um, that have happened in the past uh, years and months, um, and yeah, so um, the the idea is really right now to present this uh, uh, this model law and uh, and try to collect as much feedback um, in order to improve it. You're mute, Marshad. What I'll be doing for the next few minutes is to give um, a bit more fun, like now that we have the context, a bit more about the content, about what um, the model law contains and um, how it is a little bit um, different from other um, approaches to um, creating legal entity forms for DAOs. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the other model laws that we looked at in the preparation um, for drafting this um, text. So as this um, audience uh, may already be aware, uh, there have been numerous model laws for uh, new corporate forms, um, such as the Organization of American States uh, Model Act for Simplified Stock Corporations that, for example, is very flexible in terms of governance. Uh, it removes the needs for uh, a board of directors and can be uh, initiated by uh, a single shareholder. Um, we did a you know, comparison of the content of various model laws, and we also drew inspiration from several other conventions and instruments, including um, the Hague uh, Convention on Trusts, uh, on the recognition and enforcement of trusts, as well as um, uh, the model law for electronic commerce um, that was drafted by UNCITRA. And we also had to you know, consider some key questions um, in this drafting process. So did we want to have model provisions or show key objectives and principles that should be reflected in uh, a state law? So for instance, the difference between um, 
a model law with model provisions and something like UNCITRA's legislative guide for insolvency law, where it shows certain principles rather than giving um, a particular provision that needs to be um, incorporated into domestic legislation. And then we also sought to um, strike a balance between mandatory rules and default rules. So rules that would have to be present in um, a particular national legislation for it to say that it's compliant with uh, the model law, as well as more flexible default provisions where it would be possible to um, alter the provision while still being compliant with the model law. And then we also um, considered whether to include um, substantive prescriptive rules or uh, disclosure rules. Um, again, there are different approaches to this depending on um, uh, in depending on the um, particular um, approach that we are trying to to facilitate. And as we see in contemporary especially corporate governance discourse, there is an increased emphasis on disclosure rules, for instance. So I won't go over the, um, uh, the particular principles because those uh, were, uh, two of them were already discussed um, a, a fair, fairly um, in depth already by, by Primavera. Um, I will mention if, if for this particular audience, um, the idea of functional equivalence and regulatory equivalence is um, unfamiliar. It's the idea that functional equivalence allows the establishment of equivalence between an object that is already within the realm of a legal rule and another object that isn't encompassed by it. So we think of the, you know, the functional equivalence between a wet signature and uh, electronic signatures. And regulatory equivalence uh, relies on the same technique but it identifies the object or purpose of, of any given regulation as a goal. And it allows for the establishment of equivalence between uh, the function of a legal rule and the function of a technology. So one example of regulatory equivalence is uh, between registration requirements for the deployment of a decentralized autonomous organization on a permissionless blockchain. So in our view, the deployment of a smart contract in a blockchain with relevant data about a DAO is not functionally equivalent to registration into a corporate registry, but the policy objectives of publicity that we have when we register a, a company, those publicity requirements are being met in this process and they're being achieved. So our model law applies a principles-based approach to identify the policy objectives and principles uh, underlying provisions of corporate law in uh, major jurisdictions. And it seeks to implement these objectives and principles by limiting uh, its scope to DAOs that meet specific technical uh, and governance standards and by providing rules that recognize uh, that these DAOs technological features offer satisfactory protections and meet purposes in a manner that is equivalent to existing law. Uh, so it provides a minimal level of rights, duties, and protections that is generally recognized in legislation on corporate entities. Um, and it tries to address, um, and as, as we discussed in the commentary, uh, vertical agency problems between you know, the classic principal agent problem. It tries to deal with problems between majority and minority principles. And it also tries to deal with the firm and stakeholder agency problem. And the goal uh, is then to ultimately achieve traditional objectives of corporate law by relying on technological means where possible. So Article 1 um, and Chapter 1 in general sets out the range of economic and social activities that DAOs can engage in, um, the rights and obligations that DAOs can enjoy as a separate legal person, and has important definitions that the model law uses. So Article 1, for instance, suggests that a DAO is a legal entity that can be used for a wide range of activities, some activities that haven't been, in some cases, um, explored yet, but we want to keep it open so that, in the, that it is able to encompass future activities of DAOs beyond, let's say, decentralized finance or certain types of service work. Uh, Article 2 bestows a legal personality to DAOs that fall within the scope of the model law and um, suggests that DAO's liabilities are met by 
uh, all of their assets. And this is um, for us quite important because uh, one of the goals we seek to achieve substantively is for unregistered DAOs to be able to access limited liability. And so we were very concerned in trying to uh, meet the potential concerns of policymakers about how limited liability um, and legal personality would not be abused. And so, um, you know, we, and especially given recent events, this becomes even more uh, of an important point. And so um, we included at the, at the very outset um, the, the need for DAO's liabilities to be met by the assets. Article 3 then provides very important definitions. I won't go through all of them because um, we do not have the time to do so, but I think we have to um, mention some of them. One of them that's very important is the definition of DAOs itself. Uh, DAOs refer to uh, smart contracts. Um, I think many of you who are in the room uh, on Zoom or in person are already familiar with what smart contracts are. Um, it refers to smart contracts deployed on a public permissionless blockchain, which implements specific decision-making or governance rules, in enabling a multiplicity of actors to coordinate themselves in a decentralized fashion. These governance rules must be uh, technically, although not necessarily operationally, decentralized. And here, um, the reason why, for instance, we place emphasis on public permissionless blockchain is not only to emphasize the fact that we um, are only interested in a particular type of blockchain, but also um, to emphasize that we are interested in uh, DAOs that are at least um, technically decentralized, while conceding that there are DAOs who might fit within this definition that are not uh, necessarily operationally decentralized. So um, the emphasis is very much on technical decentralization, though of course we also hope that their uh, operational governance uh, will also be uh, decentralized. Then um, going to the formation requirements, this is really like the heart of the model though, because it's by meeting these requirements that we argue that an unregistered DAO would be able to gain the benefit of, uh, for instance, legal personality, limited liability, and so on. So to be granted legal personality, a DAO must fulfill these um, nine requirements. And it's, you know, involves deployment on Oh, sorry. I saw the comments in the chat. Um, so to be, yeah, it has to be deployed on a permissionless blockchain, of course, as the um, definition requires. It, it, there is a necessity to provide a, a unique public address. And so this, as you can see, uh, coming back to the points about regulatory equivalence, uh, just like a corporation would require a unique postal address where it can be contacted, here, we try to create the equivalent of this by uh, providing a unique public address. Um, the software code has to be posted open source in a public forum. And again, we're trying to, um, for instance, meet policy concerns about transparency uh, and you know, openness by having the software code um, by, as a requirement, being posted in a public forum that is accessible um, to anyone to, to look at and audit. And that leads to the fourth uh, criteria where there has to be a quality assurance audit to um, often, you know, by hiring a third party that is able to do this to see if the, the code that is being used by the DAO uh, is able to do what it says it does, that it, it, to, to see if it's vulnerable to hacks, for instance. And then fifthly, um, it should have at least one a user interface um, that's, that can read key variables. And so someone from outside would be able to um, learn certain key information uh, about the DAO in a user-friendly manner. Um, again, as by, by the definition, the governance system, um, at least technically, should be decentralized. And there should be um, comprehensible bylaws that are not just, um, you know, somehow baked into uh, the code in this sort of idea of trying to achieve code as law, but should have um, a, a normal set of bylaws that are comprehensible to any, to any human being uh, who can, you know, speak the uh, the language of the of the bylaw, and that should also be posted online and should be available for anyone to read. 
um, so that they know about at least the operational governance of the DAO. And just like there is a provision of a unique public address, um, there's also the need to have a point of contact for the DAO. And um, again, this meets this particular policy objective of being reachable. Um, for instance, if we are thinking of one of the reasons why contact addresses are available, it's for uh, servicing service um, of legal documents. So that's again, one of the reasons why uh, we felt that there needs to be a point of contact. And finally, um, there needs to be a dispute resolution mechanism that is able that is open um, for those who are part of the uh, DAO to be able to access um, so that any particular dispute that isn't um, addressable ex ante can be addressed ex post. And as we will sort of um, try to point out, you can see that none of these criteria require registration in a particular corporate registry or business registry. And um, I think this is one of the key differences between our approach and the approach uh, taken in a lot of US states so till date, as well as in some other uh, jurisdictions outside of the US where they basically try to create um, a limited liability corporate structure, which um, they call, let's say a DAO LLC or a DAO limited liability company. And then you have to use that and register it. And so our approach is different in the sense that uh, there is no registration requirement, but instead takes a principles-based approach to address a lot of these policy concerns that um, are usually met. Okay. Um, I will continue moving on. Um, we then move to another very important provision of the model law, which is about uh, limited liability. So in, uh, like in many sort of traditional uh, corporate law statutes or uh, cooperative law statutes, uh, we have a provision of limited liability and the language um, is quite similar. Members will not be held liable for any obligations incurred by the DAO beyond their uh, contributions. However, members are responsible in tort for their own wrongful act or omission, but not personally liable for the wrongful act or omission of any other DAO. Um, this was uh, a really heated discussion that we had to understand in what um, circumstances would there be exceptions or sort of derogations from limited liability. Um, because of the fact that um, we recognize that not all sort of harms can be um, captured through contractual means, there will be a non-contractual um, liabilities arising, for instance, through tort, um, as through torts committed by the DAO or um, a, a person acting um, lawfully on behalf of the DAO. And so we felt that because of this, it is impo important to deal with how do we you know, allocate responsibility in those cases. And so um, we, in this case, say that if there is a tort, um, you know, this member who is responsible for the tort will be responsible for themselves and that will be separated from that, the liability of the DAO. And then um, the other aspect of this, of course, is that if um, another DAO has a type of interest with, um, let's say, the DAO that we are concerned with, they will not be responsible for the wrongful acts or omissions that are committed by any other DAOs either. So again, this is a way of trying to shield um, the DAO from liabilities, uh, both internally, but also externally. Um, the third aspect of this was to deal with a question that's becoming increasingly important now, where because of um, the pseudonymous nature or, and globally distributed nature of DAOs, there is a concern about um, DAOs not complying with enforceable judgments. And uh, though the sort of compromise that we came up with is that those members who voted against complying with the judgment that has been given against the DAO uh, will be liable for any monetary payments that were ordered within the uh, judgment in proportion to their share of govern uh, governance rights in the DAO. And so here the allocation of blame is of course going to those who have greater voting power, sort of like the idea of a um, 
a majority shareholder or, or a particular uh, person who has more influence within an organization being more responsible if they decide to not comply with a legal judgment. There may be concerns, um, you know, regarding the abuse of lim limited liability. There was when limited liability was first granted to corporations too. Um, and we think that this may be addressed by DAOs introducing a requirement for members to make a financial contribution to a reserve fund or towards the premiums of an appropriate insurance policy um, so as to access this benefit of limited liability. But we leave this open because um, the solutions that are being developed to try to deal with this are um, constantly evolving. But this is mentioned by us in the commentary. And as you'll notice, there is a sort of veil piercing option in um, Article 5.3. And again, this is also intended to mitigate the risk of any sort of uh, abuse of limited liability by members. Um, and it tries to ensure that uh, members will not try to uh, simply refuse to pay judgment uh, against a DAO. So Article 6 to 15 uh, seeks to allow DAOs to have uh, as much flexibility in how they internally organize while seeking to ensure that members are aware of their rights or the, the lack of rights and protections. Because this is because chapter four of the model law builds on the question of how a DAO under the model law is to be governed. It's um, this sort of chapter is common in again, um, all corporate law, cooperative law statutes. Uh, it seeks to allow DAOs to have flexibility in how their internal organization and procedures take place. For instance, um, it doesn't mandate or require in-person physical meetings at all, even though that is of course possible. And the model law enables management by consensus, as well as the appointment of administrators. So one very important provision here um, that I'll mention is about legal representatives and another one is about fiduciary status. So the model law recognizes that the DAO may need to have representation of chain for certain purposes and activities. So not all of the transactions that a DAO uh, will undertake will just be with, within the uh, blockchain network or with uh, those who are part of the so-called like, crypto economy. So what this chapter provides is a procedure for uh, appointing a legal representative with narrowly defined powers that can interact with territorially bound national jurisdictions. So imagine a DAO um, that is unregistered that is seeking to rent um, commercial real estate or is trying to um, hire a person to do something that and that person has nothing to do um, with uh, blockchain altogether. In the spirit of contractual freedom, DAOs are permitted to appoint fiduciaries if they wish. Um, but what we try to make clear is that just by holding uh, a particular position with a particular title, uh, and having a limited amount of discretionary decision-making power, that should not in itself imply fiduciary status. So this is seen as being a complement to the provision about being a legal representative, that just because someone is appointed a legal, as a legal representative, we are not um, you know, giving them the sort of discretionary power that a fiduciary usually has. And the reason for this is because um, DAOs might often appoint a person just for a very limited purpose, and that purpose, and that person is not able to do anything beyond that limited purpose. And so to classify them as a fiduciary would be unjust and unfair on that person and lead to all sorts of unpleasant legal consequences for them. And so while Article 14 talks about how a legal representative can be appointed, gives um, you know the person the you know, opportunity to be a fiduciary if, if the DAO wants it. Article 15 says that there should be no implicit fiduciary status conferred uh, on a DAO member just because of their title um, that they have. Article 16, um, which is part of Chapter 5, um, provides that by default, um, you know, what will happen if a DAO has to, you know, undergo um, a particular change in its technical features. So chapter five recognizes that DAOs have technical features that raise new questions um, that are not, you know, encountered by a normal company or cooperative or partnership. Um, these technical features raise uh, new questions that merit specific treatment. 
This chapter therefore includes specific articles that concern the consequences of contentious forks, modifications, upgrades, and migrations on, uh, and uh, of a blockchain network and how uh, this af can affect the legal personality of a DAO, as well as the uh, claims and assets that are on uh, the DAO. So Article 16 provides that uh, after a hard fork, the majority chain uh, will continue to have the uh, off-chain assets of the DAO, while Article 17 provides requirements for a DAO to retain benefits under the model law following uh, migrations, upgrades, and modifications. Then Article 18 uh, deals with another very important aspect of DAOs, especially those of you who are familiar with DAOs, you know that there is the risk of there being what we call a failure event. Um, and there, if um, what happens to the limited liability and legal personality that we're conferring on these uh, unregistered DAOs. So um, these technical failure events are again, you know, particular uh, to DAOs. And what we argue is that uh, even in the event of such a technical failure, in general, person legal personality and limited liability should be maintained, except the liability of persons who are grossly negligent or acting in manifest bad faith in making a decision. And in those cases, um, there can be the opportunity for you know, a limited liability not protecting those individuals. So again, you can see how uh, in crafting the model though, we were trying to deal with the various situations in which um, limited liability protection um, is typically um, also you know, weakened or the veil is lifted in normal corporate law as well, and then trying to craft equivalence to this within the, the model law itself. And moving on to Article 19, uh, which is part of Chapter 6, this is the final part of the model law, and it includes two important miscellaneous provisions that are necessary in creating a coherently complete legal framework for DAOs. So it specifies uh, when general business organization law should be applied to DAOs by a jurisdiction uh, that adopts the model law. So we've tried to create um, a framework through the model law that is able to capture a lot of different uh, events and eventualities that might happen, as well as you know provide uh, reference to the internal bylaws of the DAO, so as to capture as many um, eventualities as possible. But of course, there will be aspects uh, and issues that are not uh, countenanced by the model law. And so then you need to refer to a general body of law uh, as you know, a reference for what principles will be applied, what remedies will be used. And so there uh, we specify, um, you know, the when general business organization laws should be applied. Um, so for instance, this can be based on the jurisdiction, it can be their laws about um, LLPs or LLCs or even cooperatives. Um, in some cases, it can be about certain types of partnership. It depends on uh, the jurisdiction in question. But what we try to clarify is that only lacuna in the bylaws and the model law should be filled by domestic general business organization law. And if there is any ambiguity arising from uh, the gap filling function, it should be resolved in a manner that upholds the objectives and the letter of the model law. And this is because we want to avoid the situation where jurisdictions try to impose um, general principles from, let's say, corporate law onto DAOs even when they're not fit for purpose. Um, and finally, with respect to Article 20, uh, it establishes the recognition of DAOs as uh, pass-through entities for tax purposes, so as to simplify the process of taxation for DAOs, which are non-territorial and transnational by their very nature, and instead make members and participants responsible for tax compliance, so they become individually responsible. This is a provision that we would really uh, appreciate feedback on, because this is something that uh, we included based on our knowledge at the time, but we are really trying to develop uh, our provisions and thoughts on how DAOs can be taxed and how their members and participants can be taxed. So if there's any comments on this from the room, um, whether in Zoom or um, in, the, in person in uh, Addis Ababa, we'd be really appreciate it. So uh, we have some questions for the audience. Um, what, as I mentioned, in addition to this taxation provision, do you think these articles are adequately drafted? And um, are there particular ones that you think should be amended? 
what other articles uh, do you think can be included? And then finally, like an even broader question, is a model law still the right instrument? Or do we have to seek something more normative, such as a legislative guide? I mentioned the use of legislative guides in the past. Or do we use something that is more prescriptive and mandatory, such as a convention that would be applicable to all the states that ratify? Thank you very much. The floor is open for questions. I would like to ask a question from the audience, if possible. Good afternoon yes, and good morning. Uh, my name is Dino Dalaj. I'm the Chief Information Officer of the United Nations Pension Fund. Um, I have a particular interest in blockchain. I designed and implemented a blockchain solution for digital identity at the UN. And I'm also uh, a former auditor of the, of the UN. Uh, in response to the first question that was um, submitted to the audience, I wanted to share a comment vis-a-vis -vis Article 3 and Article 4. Uh, specifically, on Article 3, there is a definition of quality assurance. And that definition makes specific and uh, reference to the fact that quality assurance is defined as the completion of professional software security audit, and I emphasize the word software. However, on Article 4, in the formation of requirement, the first requirement is for a DAO to be deployed on a permission, permissionless blockchain. And on letter D, there is a concept that says the software code of the DAO must have undergone quality assurance. So um, a couple of comments here. The first comment is, it's not clear whether this software security audit, first and foremost, is intended to be only pre-implementation, or whether instead there is a concept and expectation where an audit vis-a-vis -vis the quality of the DAO is also to be expected ongoing. Because as we know, bugs are not necessarily always found before a system is implemented, but oftentimes are found when the system is already uh, under implementation. The second comment, which is for me it requires more attention, is the fact that if indeed the concept of quality assurance refers to software security audit, but at the same time, the requirement is for the DAO to be deployed on a permissionless blockchain. So a blockchain is not composed only by software, but also by hardware. There are different layers within a DAO, within a blockchain, and therefore, if we are looking at a, at a, at a concept of assurance vis-a-vis -vis the quality of the DAO, limiting to software, I think, is very risky. I think there should be there a, a, more, a broader definition that they would go beyond software and um, uh, include in, its, in the scope of an audit other, the other element that compose a blockchain. Thank you very much. I think those are really good comments. Um, just ch chiming in here um, on um, uh, when this was drafted, most of the people who um, worked on it are part of the Ethereum space. So I think the question on the quality of the blockchain itself um, didn't didn't uh, cross our mind, to be honest. And I think this is a very good point because now, I mean, when we started writing this three years ago, and even when uh, two years ago, um, what was important for us was that it must be a permissionless blockchain um, that um, so that because of the transparency requirements that can be used to achieve regulatory equivalence in um, the model law. Um, but of course, um, there are permissionless blockchains that um, 
where you could question the quality of the blockchain itself. Um, and therefore, I think this, this is a really good comments, and there should probably be uh, made uh, some amendments um, to that provision. Um, in relation to the question as to whether the, uh, the audit should be ongoing um, or not, again, a really uh, great comment. Um, I think the, the, the requirement uh, put um, in the text right now was that um, when you start your DAO, then you, at the beginning, you should have um, at least uh, uh, an audit, like a, um, not or even better, have your uh, code uh, formally verified. Um, obviously, bugs also turn up during the an, more so during the process. Um, but what we identified at it, um, was that um, often uh, projects that are hacked, that uh, have very bad security audits or that didn't do a security audit. So personally, I think there should be an ongoing requirement. Again, this is not yet um, reflected in the model law. Um, at the minimum at the moment of how I read it or how it was understood at the time and, and more shit than Primavera and anyone else please ch chime in. Um, it was um, a security audit um, that uh, complies with industry standards at the very beginning of the DAO. Um, however, also if um, things change or if the DAO is updated, you would need uh, to have an audit again. But a super good comments. Um, I think there should be some amendments to this provision on this. Because also right now, we had a very long discussion as to what is actually in this, what are industry standards. And those industry standards are changing quite quickly in the blockchain um, ecosystem. Um, currently, for example, it's very difficult to uh, get uh, contracts firmly verified. It's only possible for very simple, simple um, smart contracts, and it's very, very expensive, like going into the millions of dollars for the for the system to get a formal verification. And therefore, we didn't uh, require it in the documentation. But with things changing, there should be some way to adapt the commentary and to make the um, DA model law um, less time sensitive. Um, and we, I mean, we would really appreciate some more input, especially from people outside of the Ethereum ecosystem, because currently um, the, the model law is very Ethereum focused or like there's a lot of undertones which relate to the Ethereum ecosystem that make it not entirely suitable um, for also the other uh, blockchains. And I agree that there are several permissionless blockchains where you do have to wonder about the quality of the validators or the the um, the mining or the proof of work uh, mechanism that is used, the consensus mechanism used. We were, I mean, we would be super happy to discuss this further with you. Yeah, if, if you'd kindly be able to share um, an email or a contact uh, uh, address, we, we uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this with you more um, after the event. I see. Sure, uh, thank you. There's, I see there's a question in the chat, but. Um, I don't know which one we should go to first. Are there other questions in the room that I can't see? I think we could take the question in the chat in relation to separate liability. So um, the main focus was about um, the liability of the, the, the organization. Um, we do deal with... Um, the liability, like we, we by talking about the the judgments and the enforceability of the judgments, we do end up going into some liability questions that are beyond, you know, the the liability of the the entity itself. But um, the idea is that we are looking at separate liability rather than um, you know liability altogether 
to encompass all different forms of liability that might arise. Like, as I, as I said, we uh, touch upon some points about how um, the liability of the entity might interface with, um, for instance, a personal liability of an individual who's committed a tort, but for the most part, it's about the organization itself. But thank you uh, for that question. Um, Michael Henning has a question with regard to Article 4. Michael? Hello. Yes, can you hear me all right? My name is uh, Michael Henning. I'm a finance lawyer who works for the government of St. Helena. Um, St. Helena is a small British territory off the coast of West Africa, and we're currently about to start a project to implement some sort of legislation to recognize DAOs. Um, so my specific question is with respect to Article 4 and what I'll call the passive legal recognition of DAOs that's proposed by not having a need for registration. So my concern is with respect to the lack of certainty to the status of DAOs without having a registration mechanism uh, and that potentially it sort of establishes a backward looking or a continuous assessment that needs to be made at any given point of time to determine whether the DAO in fact does benefit from legal personhood and limited liability. So I'm just, I'm just wondering if you have any comments with respect to that. I'll hand it over to you, um, Morshad Silkio Primavera. Um, Hani, um, if I, um, Michael, if I uh, may, um, can you just uh, elaborate on what, what, if I understand it correctly, the question is because um, you have to do a, an assessment at that point in time, you don't have enough legal certainty as you would have with a company that is registered, for example, um, in a register as limited by shares, a company limit, but limited by shares. Is that correct? Yeah, so with, with a typical company registry, the legal personhood and the limited liability comes into existence usually at the point of registration. And so if, if this proposal does not include a requirement for registration, then my concern is that continuously at any given point of time, any third party that's interacting with a DAO will need to conduct to some degree an assessment of whether that DAO actually is fulfilling the formation requirements. And this could actually be backward, look, backward looking in a lot of circumstances where disputes potentially arise around contracts or interactions that have occurred months or, or years prior. Um, I think the the, the, um, the current uh, document could be uh, slightly amended in relation to that, but that's a general problem of like um, focusing on DAOs and not to have registration requirements. So basically because what, what we've been arguing in the document is that because we have regulatory and partially also functional equivalents, but in that respect, in terms of uh, registration, um, uh, regulatory equivalents, um, my suggestion on this would be the, for the DAO to basically show that they do fulfill these requirements, um, for example, on the interface. Um, or yeah, like through, some, uh, through some other mechanism. And please, Primavera, chime in here. Yeah, I think we, we had those discussions um, at, at various uh, moments. And, uh, you know, the idea is like, you actually have like in the US and so forth, I mean, there is, there is other type of uh, non-incorporated um, entity that do have legal personality. And I mean, this is a problem that exists once you choose that uh, it is a non-incorporated entity. Uh, one way that we had uh, identified a possible solution for the issue that you raise is that we could have some kind of uh, external authority uh, that actually certify Right. And so a DAO, while there is no legal requirement for the DAO to 
uh, to incorporate in the traditional sense of incorporation uh, because the registration on the blockchain can be regarded as being regulatory equivalent because not everyone has probably the skill set and especially in the early days it might it might not be obvious when one DAO qualify or doesn't qualify uh, you can have some kind of like attestation authority that uh, engage into this type of work and so a DAO can collect uh, badges uh, or attestation that it has been certified by this entity or this other entity. Regulators could even do that in order to show we consider this DAO to fulfill the requirement that we regard as regulatory equivalent. And so instead of having a model in which you don't get any legal personality unless you have registered and incorporated, we have a model in which there is a legal personality that can emerge under certain conditions. And in order to create more certainty about whether or not it exists, then we rely on third party uh, or regulatory authority that uh, can uh, that have a task of actually verifying and maybe doing like ongoing verification that it is still the case. Uh, and issuing badge, badges so that when I interact with a DAO, I can choose, do I want to take the risk because maybe it's a DAO that didn't get a badge, but I can do the assessment on my own, but therefore I'm, I'm more likely to, to, to be in, the, in a legal uncertain zone. Or I request the DAO to, if I want to make like a million dollar uh, uh, inter interaction with it, I will request the DAO, please, uh, get a certification from one trusted authority before I, I engage uh, in a transaction with you. The good thing is that it you don't have to, and that the law doesn't prescribe it. So this is an option, but it isn't a requirement for having um, having that status. And the idea is also that over time, probably there will be more standardized system like uh, mm -hmm. DAOs factories, which do. Uh, fulfill those requirements by design and therefore it becomes easier like I know it's one of those DAOs that uh, have been stemming from this particular uh, uh, factory therefore I have a, a stronger confidence that it qualify and then more idiosyncratic DAO then they will require more uh, scrutiny but basically the idea is like the the ecosystem the industry most likely can figure things out in order to reduce legal certainty uh, but what we consider is that it is very important that we don't require registration, especially because requiring registration by definition requires that the DAO does incorporate in a country uh, as opposed to maintaining its status of being something that is transnational. Does that answer your question, Michael? Moshed, would you like to give us some um, final words, some wrap ups? things that you would want the audience to um, contact you on or to give you feedback on. Uh, earlier I showed the website. There is a feedback form on the website. So the team really wants you to provide information to them. Uh, just before we close out again, I will show the website and the email contacts with Morshed. Um, sorry, any more questions from the audience? No, I don't think so. I think there's one more question on insolvency by Michael. Michael, yes, go ahead. I, um, yeah, I, I have a general question with regards to insolvency. insolvency. Um, I know you mentioned that it hasn't been looked at in too much detail in, in the current model law. Um, is there a, a, a general proposal on, on how to handle insolvencies going forward? Certainly from a jurisdictional uh, perspective, one of our big concerns is we simply don't have the resources or expertise to fund a judicial system that would be able to deal with all the technical and uh, relatively cutting edge aspects that would go into an insolvency of a DAO that we legally recognized. So I was just wondering if there is a, a general approach that has been discussed. 
So the insolvency provision, unfortunately, um, has not been looked in detail and there hasn't been um, a, um, a common approach um, found to this. So um, we are reconstituting this um, DAO um, force to amend the uh, Koala model law um, at the moment. And two of the provisions that um, we, from our side, identified as being needing update in addition to what was said right now and a few others is especially the tax provision and um, insolvency considerations especially seeing um, the many insolvencies in the blockchain crypto space at the moment in time and the DAO um, involvements in those um, so we haven't found a common ground on the insolvency um, provisions yet but we hope to work on this in the coming months If I might add um, a couple of um, points about this, I, I think um, in addition to what Mavera was saying about accreditation authorities, we of course see precedent for this when it comes to nonprofits, for instance, um, uh, where you would have a body, for instance, like a charity commission or an equivalent who uh, on a yearly basis, um, in some cases, at least a yearly basis, uh, in a way at audits, whether a charity is still a charity or not, whether it's meeting its purposes, whether it's um, undertaking all of the obligations that it signed up to when it formed a, a charity or is benefiting from a particular type of charitable status. And so there is that example to look at um, as inspiration. And there's also, um, I think the example that we're seeing of you know accreditation authorities being used widely outside of even the blockchain space when it comes to uh, corporations in general, whether it, you're talking about, you know, the uh, development of B Corps to all the way to, you know, looking at different sorts of environmental and other sorts of labels that are used and constantly being um, uh, adapted and companies are, you know, being listed and delisted based on um, how they comply. And there is this, you know, private sector approach to dealing with this too. I think um, coming to the topic of insolvency, um, I will just mention a, a topic that we discussed extensively um, a couple of years ago when we were drafting the model law and is now perhaps um, something that we will be able to um, bring back in the you know version 2.0 of the model law is about um, liquidation and about restructuring. And so far, we focused on just like, you know, the technical failure events and, you know, what, what happens then. And we decided to leave out um, what does it mean to liquidate a DAO and what does it mean to restructure a DAO. Um, but I think because of work, for instance, with um, understanding digital assets, understanding um, the jurisdictional questions about digital assets because of more people who are familiar with private international law in engaging with these questions, as well as uh, the fact that the Law Commission in the UK has also mentioned this issue of insolvency uh, with respect to digital assets and DAOs, uh, means that we are at a really you know, opportune moment to you know, come back to this question that at that stage was very nascent, um, but also to try to you know, uh, uh, shape this conversation too. So, you know, I was asked to give um, a closing remark, um, and I would say that we are at this moment uh, in time where there is a lot of um, interest now um, by policymakers as well in uh, how the future of DAOs evolve, and especially unregistered DAOs. And I think that um, the model law is like a living document and is one that is still uh, open to amendment, and I really hope that after hearing about you know the formation requirements, the governance requirements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, the audience here you know leaves with the impression that you know there is, there has been a lot of thought put into this, but there is still something that you can contribute. And if um, you have uh, the time or the interest, please uh, use our um, contact form that was just shared by Carol to get in touch with us, so that we can um, have a role in shaping this conversation about DAOs, um, not only in the places like the UK where this has uh, been openly and publicly announced as a, as a priority that they want to look at, 
but also in other parts of the world too. Um, we are particularly interested, as Silke mentioned, about issues about um, taxation and insolvency. We're also very interested in thinking of how the use of um, you know, experimental lawmaking like regulatory sandboxes can also be used to the benefit of DAOs. So if you have, uh, again, um, comments that are particular to this, um, please share it with us. And finally, um, something that we didn't discuss, but one of the um, participants today mentioned, if you have particular comments that are about the wider um, permissionless ecosystem that uh, you think um, you know, should be addressed or is un insufficiently addressed in the model law, please let us know about this as well. Our, our details are um, made available on the, the slide as you can see. Thank you. I don't know whether Silke or Dr. Primavera de Filippi has any also questions or closing comments before we close off today's session. I don't, but I would really love to have more people co um, contribute, as Marsha had already said, um, especially on the tax and insolvency um, aspects, which I am working on right now with uh, teams and we are constituting a team on this. So please get in touch. I think we have this really interesting question in the chat if we have time. I'm not sure if we do, but if we do, um, I'm, I'm happy to read it out and um, we do. maybe some, someone would like to talk about this. Go right ahead. Um, so um, Christine Kaufman shares that uh, she is the chair of the OECD Working Party on Responsible Business Conduct where they discuss corporate due diligence related to sustainability uh, at large based on the OECD guidelines for MEs. Um, has due diligence for non-financial corporate impacts, for example, on human rights or the environment, been a consideration when drafting Article 5? Um, happy to discuss further bilaterally. Uh, yeah. Thank you uh, for this great question, because one of it, we, the topic of uh, like non-financial corporate impacts was not only something that um, we did discuss uh, in part in trying to understand the types of liability that a DAO would uh, encounter. Um, and we acknowledge that this wouldn't only be limited to, um, you know, like some type of financial damage. Um, and so one of the reasons why we brought in, for instance, discussions about um, tort liability was because we, uh, you know, were able to, uh, consider the, the possibility that, for instance, there could be environmental harm um, that is created. And we wanted to also have some provisions that deal with this. If you feel that this, this is something that um, needs to be strengthened or can be, uh, the language can be modified in a certain way, we'd be very happy to uh, discuss this uh, with you uh, bi bilaterally. I think this um, issue, especially about environmental impact, has become um, very prominent in this space, especially um, as we know, with the, the Ethereum merge, uh, you know, the climate change impact of blockchain was like a very strong impetus behind why the merge happened. And that was something that they themselves, like Ethereum itself says um, in its publicity material about the merge. So there is clearly like this interest in the non-financial impact that um, this broader ecosystem has. And um, if there is something not only in Article 5, but perhaps also in other provisions that you think are relevant. For instance, Silka mentioned insolvency. We also know that um, insolvency provisions can also have an impact on like the type of redress that let's say um, uh, mass tort litigants or those who have suffered uh, who are claimants to you know, environmental claims um, can have as well. We, this, could, this would be a very important um, discussion um, for us to have uh, after the event. And I think because we really try to take a disclosure-based approach to um, you know, a lot of our sort of compliance and trying to meet these um, regulatory objectives, I think um, there is a lot to you know, learn from um, the, uh, for, uh, learn from your working party on how we can do this um, in, a, in, a, in a better way perhaps. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything or we can wrap up. 
Okay, we, we need to wrap up, thanks. So I'd like to um, thank everyone who joined us today, both in person and in the Zoom room. Um, I hope that you're able to uh, note down our contact details. It's also available um, online. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us and for um, asking and com excellent questions and giving us uh, a lot of uh, uh, takeaways from this year event. I hope that you also found it useful. And thank you also to uh, Silke Primavera Vashti Carol and uh, Michael Henning for joining as speakers and contributing uh, today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Let's be in touch. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Carol. Big Caribbean hug to you. You're welcome. Well received. Thank you so much. Have a great day.